Hello and welcome to a special edition of Staring at a Blank Page, sponsored by idofestivals.co.uk. This is a special edition recorded at the Ashcroft Arts Centre in Fareham, where I'm speaking to Gareth Howes and William Harper about the show that they're doing about the history of protest songs. I am uh, at the Ashcroft Arts Centre in Fareham uh, with Gareth Howes and William Harper. Hello, gents. Hello. Hello. Can you tell us what we're doing here? We're just setting up the gig for tonight, which is going to be um, the first gig in a project that we're doing called The Brief History of the Protest Song. Uh, and how did it come about? Uh, this came about after I bought a Mojo magazine cover CD, which was about 80s protest songs. And in the cover notes it said, uh, it said about how almost faced with an identical set of circumstances to the 80s, where are all the people now willing to sing out about it? And I thought, well, they're everywhere. If you go to a festival, you will see them all over the place. They're just not in the mainstream media. So I thought we'd do this to try and uh, try and sort of showcase that. Mm. So d- just taking it back uh, perhaps a few years, you were obviously a music fan for some time, but when was the first time you heard a song that you would class as a protest song that stood out as a protest song with a more of a message than just you know uh, oh darling you've broken my heart but, you know but, <laughs> but what would you say your earliest memory of, of hearing a song that really grabbed you like that um for me it was probably when i was a kid i grew up my mum used to play me all sorts of 60s music so i used to listen to a lot of it but i think it was probably listening to some probably some bob dylan was probably the first thing i heard and thought oh there's something in these lyrics but then i seem to remember i think it was actually the first one I really, really noticed probably was a, it was a bootleg CD I had of Pearl Jam doing different things, and there was a live version of them covering Masters of War, which is a Bob Dylan song. And that was, mm-hmm. I sort of listened to that and listened to the lyrics and thought, this is amazing, and then looked into it a bit more. And I was, I was probably only about 10 at the time, so it was it's quite, quite early it's, on. It's quite good that we're doing Masters of War because I can trace it back to that as well. <laughs> uh, because we, uh, I, I kind of I grew up on like Simon Garfunkel with Every Brothers Rock and Roll, and and kind of things, but because well, I was an 80s kid. Um, listening to lots of mainstream 80s stuff. I was a Queen fan as well. But, but Kate Bush was a big character in all of that, and Army Dreamers was was um, it was kind of a, a point there um, as far as political songwriting. But also, um, Roger Taylor from Queen on one of his solo albums did a, um, a really good version of Masters of War. Kind of controversial band, really, because of the whole Sun City thing. Um, and then denying that they were a political band, even though they've done political songs. But it's quite interesting that he, he covered Master Ball, and that was the first time I'd heard it. And then I started start collecting versions of it, and I've, I've had loads of versions of it over the years, and, and I've, been, I've been covering it myself for a long time. But when I started, first started gigging, the first songs I covered were um, political songs. What's your favourite protest song, and, and why? The first one I actually learned and played in folk clubs, along with my songs that I'd written... Was a song called "The World Turned Upside Down," um, by uh, written by Leon Rosserson, and it's about uh, the civil, English Civil War and about the diggers who were um, the the most radical kind of uh, fac- faction group of people or whatever, um, more more radical than the Levellers. The Levellers were kind of more middle class in their origins, but they had sort of far-reaching ideas for the time. But the diggers had, had even more far-reaching ideas and uh, more of a threat to what Cromwell was trying to do. Um, Although, to be fair, Cromwell was a radical in many ways. But anyway, anyway, uh, that, was, that was like a big, um, big song for me. And, and, and actually, I started collecting versions of that as well. Um, I should stop collecting things. <laughs> I am a hoarder. But I, I've had about 12 different versions of World Turned Upside Down. Chumba Wamba, um, The Oyster Band, um, Billy Bragg, and it's tons of people have covered it. Um, so I've been doing it since I was 19, 18, 18. William, same question for you. Um, that's a very tough question because there's a lot of amazing songs out there. I think some of my favourites are more uh, aren't mainstream ones. They're sort of more from the unsigned and independent artists. Uh, there's an amazing one called "United States" by a band called Seize the Day, and the lyrics in it are just they paint such a such a picture that you can feel everything that's going on in it. And it was about the the nine eleven attacks, so it's uh, yeah, but it's really powerful lyrics in that one. It's, it's interesting you talk about the the how vivid the lyrics are because it's a big thing for me about 
because I'm, I'm you know always been a big fan of of the language and how lyricists use language and for me it's quite an important part of political songwriting and there's such a range of different types of political songwriting you know we'll, we'll hopefully be uh, well we'll be talking tonight about how um, you know you can see it in rap music you can see it in soul and R&B you can see it in funk you can see it in folk music country music all those kind of things um, so it's everywhere but sometimes political songwriting can teach you stuff it can educate you uh, and some of the best songwriting um, can be it can illuminate you on something you didn't know about or proper detailed lyrics about um, an event that had happened that you, didn't, you know, that you did know something about but you didn't really know enough about those kind of things that's, that's really clever songwriting people like Bruce Coburn a Canadian songwriter um, does that all the time you know he's fascinating and, and absolutely incredible lyricist poetic as well but also you, you kind of do learn quite a lot from his songs as well and I think that's amazing possibly a, a difficult question uh, to, to answer but is there one single protest song that you could you could single out that's, that, that's had more impact than any other song in changing either a government policy or a, a social attitude or, or anything Yeah I like think that? so actually uh, Imagine by John Lennon for a song like that a song as controversial really how, as offensive in some ways like you know, imagine there's no religion Imagine there's no borders, you know, or kind of countries, all that kind of thing. Absolutely incredible, like really extreme lines to be voted the best song of all time by some public poll uh, a few years ago. For people, you know, people clearly get past all that because it's John Lennon, he was in the Beatles and it's melodic. They don't see how extreme the lines are. Yeah. That's incredible, do you know what I mean? It's that, that, to me, really has hit a nerve with people and it is massively idealistic, you know, and very ideological and powerful and fantastic and all the, for all the right reasons but incredibly well known and popular so I think that's a really clear winner in that sense as far as getting your message across you know he, he clearly did that then do you know what I mean you know lots of other people struggle to try and get that message across and he wrote that and everyone knows it don't they? would you agree with that I would, I would, I would yeah. agree with that yeah mm. that's a very good point whereas a, a lot of the songs throughout history have probably been uh, used like you say to educate people where you know information possibly wasn't as readily available as it is now so telling stories of what really happened during wars or uh, any other great uh, world changing events um, in a, uh, where have they been used to educate people in the past nowadays people have got access to information at the touch of a button is there still a place for, for that type of song, do you think, in changing attitudes and changing the world? I'd say so, definitely, because you might have all that information at your fingertips, but you've still got to know where to look. And someone writes a good song, and you, look, you hear the lyrics and think, I, I, want to think, I want to know more about that. And so you know, where, you know what you're looking for, so you start doing research into what that song's about. And then from there, you'll find more, and you'll find more and more and more things and I think, yeah, definitely, there's de always a place for a protest song because, like you say, there's, there is all the information, but there's too much information for you. To, so someone to say, this is what we're looking at. Yeah, well, I think there's two reasons why that will never, will be, will never be interfered with with social media and all the ways that we can uh, communicate and find out information. First, um, where are the facts, you know? The, the idea of alternative facts and truth being this sort of fluid thing now is extremely dangerous, but also uh, a, a major part of our culture now, you know? There's, there, 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 I'd say um, I've, I've seen so much cynicism in uh, younger, the younger generation, and, and it's partly because of that idea that, well, what do we believe now? And, you know, there's this sort of almost sort of sarcastic response to the, to the news and the events and and some of the big uh, sort of themes like racism, sexism, all that kind of stuff, you know. So I think because that's happening, that's happening as a reaction to this, well, what is the truth? You know, so I think that's why sometimes a more personal, direct form of communication like uh, political songwriting is really effective. But also that idea that it is personal, that somebody would want to sing a song like that because they felt so passionately and personally about it that makes that different from a news article or, or covering an event by some anchor on TV or whatever. You know, that, that it is a personal thing, performing at a gig. So that, even if they're covering someone else's song, it is a personal experience, and I think that makes a big difference as well. 
Uh, you mentioned uh, earlier, William, about uh, you see people at festivals who are carrying on that tradition. So you're, you're quite optimistic then that the lineage of protest songs is, is being continued and, oh. and will will carry on. Definitely, definitely. I mean, some of the festivals we play at, pretty much every stage, pretty much every every band will have at least one song that will be will have a political message or some sort of protest message, or just just the message that sort of just saying we can do this, we can do something about this, we can change. Yeah. How things are. We don't have to just accept what's going on. We can we can make our own future and decide our own things. And it's, it's not just the small or middle-sized festivals over because the bigger ones will have a stage yeah. that is more that caters that kind of thing. So it's, I mean, yeah, even at Glastonbury, kind of you've got the left field stage run yeah. by Billy Bragg, which is that's yeah. all it is all day long. Is yeah. is song is protest songs and yeah. people talk and talks and they even get politicians in to yeah. to talk and people will ask them questions and they will answer. Yeah. Don't know how honestly, but they'll answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, at least they're there, and there's the opportunity yeah. for. And they dialogue. wouldn't be there if there wasn't a demand for it. So yeah, you know, it is, it is always going to be on demand because uh, ultimately it's about communication and it's about truth, and that's a part of our site. Yeah, well, the, all these things that these 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 events and people and these isms that these songs discuss, they mean a lot to everybody. You know, so if even if eighty percent of the songs are getting rid of love songs, that twenty percent means a lot to everybody. Do you know what I mean? So it'll always happen. It'll always be there. Down to some business then. Uh, this is a preview show tonight, is it? You're kind of testing the water a little we're bit. Kind of, so it was our first it? one, so yeah. we're, kind of, we're calling it a preview because we know that um, we're hoping it will continue and it will, we'll, adapt, we'll adapt the show as we go along. So if, if you came to see this one and you came to, to one six months later, it will probably be different. Okay. So that's kind of why we're sort of calling uh, it that. So if people uh, would like to bring your show to their town, how can they get, uh, get hold of you? I suppose the, uh, the easiest way is we've got a Facebook page set up called The Brief History of... I think it's called Harper and Howe's Present A Brief History of Protest. Yeah. Which is um, a bit much, isn't it? it Maybe <laughs> yeah. a long title. But yeah, uh, <laughs> but there's lots of ways there. to find us. You can find us with the William yeah, Harper page, yeah. uh, the Gareth House page, or the Bemis page. Okay, yeah. thank you both for your time. Good luck That's tonight. It. Thank you very much. Thank you. To it. Thank you. You look beautiful, by the way. <laughs> A statement. it all down before it feet. She's got some good tunes and she knows how to play. A few years later and she's playing a gig. She'd like to be noticed and she'd like to be big. Recommends her and she wants to be a star. But where's the